Hi, everyone. We're going to try and run a tight ship here. So we're one minute behind at the moment, but that's okay. Um, thank you very much for coming today. So good afternoon. My name's Jyoti Singh. Uh, I'm a partner, an M&A partner in the Melbourne Corporate Group and the head of um, the corporate team here at DLA Piper in Melbourne. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today for an in-person in-house council day. And we haven't had this in person for about four years. So we're very excited to be doing that. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. We also stand alongside the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across Australia in supporting the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So as I said, thank you very much for joining us here today and it's great to see so many faces in the audience. Um, we thought it was really important to have this in person so that uh, you could hear from us in groups, like we've got these guys uh, almost ready to go, um, and really engage on the topics. And we've really tried to put together a set of topics that are uh, topical at the moment um, and commercial for you as well to help you uh, in your roles as in-house counsel. So our in-house council day is the flagship of our WIN program, um, and that's our What In-House Lawyers Need program. And that's been running for nine years now. And really the intention is that we are developing content and um, putting it out there for you to help you in your in-house roles and to interact with the businesses that you work in. Um, and of course, today is to make sure that you get your CPD points so that you can tick that box by the end of March. Um, what I did want to say though as well is our WIN program is really shaped by feedback from you. So if there's anything you see that you like today, if there's anything you think of that you'd like us to put content together on, please let us know because we really um, want to be delivering for you, our you know, valued clients, uh, the topics and the content that you're after. At the end of today, you'll be sent a feedback survey and we'd really appreciate if you could fill that out. Um, so before I hand over to the team, just a few housekeeping items. I'm sure you noticed the sign-in sheet. So to get those points, if you can make sure you fill those out. Um, if you didn't sign them, when you arrived, um, there'll be breaks during the day. Uh, catering wise, we've got a coffee cart out the front um, to keep you going and there'll be breaks uh, of 15 minutes kind of every couple of hours so that you can grab something to eat. And we will try and keep to a fairly tight schedule so that we can get you out on time. Um, there's a few meeting rooms around if you need to, we understand if people need to take calls and things like that. There's also on this side here, a staff cafe where if you need to go and sit for a bit, please feel free um, to go in there and um, there'll be some of the DLA team in there as well. And if you need any help during the event, um, please reach out to reception um, or our, our BD team will be wandering around. I think that's all the housekeeping out of the way. Um, so I encourage you to sit back and relax and enjoy the sessions that we've prepared for you. The first session of today is changing workplaces in Australia and New Zealand, what you need to know to prepare your business. We've made sure there's a trans tasman divide here. So Laura Scampion um, is, my own. Yeah, is here from our, uh, she's an employment partner and the country managing partner um, in New Zealand. And so we're very happy to have you here today, Laura. Thank you. Um, and then also on this side, we've got Rick Catanzariti, who I'm also very happy to have here, Rick, don't worry. Uh, and also Elizabeth Cole, who really does all the work in Rick's team. Um, so without further ado, thanks for leading us out today. Over to you guys. Um, what I wanted to, or what we're going to talk about today, and thank you again, uh, echoing Jyoti's words for coming, um, is um, a couple of topics or a few topics in Australia you'll see there. There's the new respect at work provisions, and that's a very hot topic at the moment that I'm sure people are interested in and need to be aware of, uh, if particularly if you're in-house counsel. Um, there's some couple of recent decisions on independent contractors, and law is also going to talk about some changes in New Zealand on that very topic uh, that are coming up. Uh, we're going to talk about some key employee entitlements that are going to increase or have increased in the coming in the legislation that was just enacted at the end of last year. Um, some other provisions of the uh, legislation that was enacted last year that uh, we thought might be of uh, interest to you. And then in terms of New Zealand, other than the um, changes to the contracted type provisions, again, we're going to talk about the fair pay agreements 
Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Restraint of Trade Bill, which is making some changes to those provisions in New Zealand, um, and then the Personal Grievances Bill and Worker Protection uh, in relation to migrant and other employees. So a lot of changes in New Zealand, and that's why we've got Laura here across the ditch, so um, she'll be able to help you with those. Um, our first topic is going to be the Respect at Work, which I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth to cover since she does all the work in our team, so we'll hear from her. Thanks, Rick, and I'm looking forward to your part of the presentation and how you do with that. Um, as Rick flagged, these are some really significant um, legislative reforms which have been introduced. Uh, the Respect at Work Act was passed at the end of last year and certain provisions are progressively coming into effect this year. There are two main changes um, which have attracted the most attention and which are going to cause employers to have a look at how they operate their businesses in order to address. So the two important changes that we're going to discuss this morning are one, there is a new prohibition on hostile workplace conduct. And second, there is the introduction of a positive duty on employers, so far as is reasonably practicable, to prevent sexual harassment, discrimination and victimisation in the workplace. I'm going to talk about hostile conduct first, if Rick could move us to the next slide, please. Um, so this prohibition on hostile conduct has come out of research which informed the legislation, which is aimed really at preventing sexual harassment and discrimination, as you would expect. And what that research found was that sexual harassment can occur in workplaces where there is I suppose, a general environment which might be hostile to people of a certain sex or where behaviours which could lead to sexual harassment are allowed um, to perpetuate or be flourished. So what this prohibition does is it is aimed at preventing um, hostile situations from occurring. And a hostile situation could be something like displaying obscene material in the workplace or pornographic material it could be an environment where there is sexual banter or where sexual jokes um, are encouraged or are allowed to happen. And so what this reform does is it is aimed at employers stepping in to prevent that conduct and it makes it a penalty provision under the Act to allow this kind of conduct to occur. And as you can see, it's it's more general um, than those specific examples that I have provided. It's really about stamping out any behaviour which could disproportionately affect a certain group because of their sex. Um, this change has been enacted now, so it is currently in place, but there are certain enforcement mechanisms which have been delayed, which I'll talk about in a moment. But moving on to the second major change, which is a positive duty which has been introduced to, so far as is reasonably practicable, prevent sexual harassment, discrimination or victimisation. Yeah, it's all there in the name and the description. What this is aimed at doing is really stamping out this conduct from the beginning. So what it means is that employers need to proactively think about these types of offences or these types of unlawful conduct and look at how your business could be allowing these behaviours to occur, not just responding to complaints of behaviour as they arise. So in terms of um, how it might operate in practice, it's not enough for employers to say, well, bullying, harassment, discrimination, that's unlawful, and we tell our employees that. It's about uh, taking more active steps to prevent that behaviour. So that is things like looking at risks of where that behaviour could occur, uh, employers maintaining risk registers, thinking about certain scenarios to prevent circumstances where sexual harassment could occur. Moving on to some of the other things that the Act also does, um, I flagged that I would come to enforcement mechanisms. From December this year, the Australian Human Rights Commission has enforcement powers to actually enter into workplaces and investigate what employers are doing to comply with the positive obligation. And they will have the power to enter into enforceable undertakings with employers. So come to employers and say, you're not doing this and we require you to do this. 
otherwise we might take you to court um, and seek penalties from you. Some other things that the Act does which are significant changes is that it has lowered the bar for sexual harassment. As you can see there, that's not a typo in the slide. Um, what it has done is it has changed the bar for sexual harassment so that it's no longer seriously demeaning conduct. It is any demeaning conduct on the basis of sex. The Act also changes some of the costs mechanisms for people who make complaints of sexual harassment and who pursue litigation on that basis. And it's also extended the time limit for making complaints. So it, previously it was six months for complainants to um, make external complaints about behaviour. That has been extended to 24 months. So there's now a significant period where employees can actually take external action to enforce these rights. Moving on to Laura and New Zealand. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting that I think New Zealand and Australia share that drive towards lengthening the time in which you can make a complaint um, for a personal grievance if it is harassment or discrimination related. And I think we're seeing across the globe really a movement towards that in terms of opening up the options for employees, giving them more time to understand what's going on and the fact that they you know, ha have the power to make a complaint. So there's a real shift there. Um, but but I'm going to talk a little bit about a bit about that later in New Zealand. But what I'm going to start with is the biggest change in New Zealand employment law in 20 years, um, and that is fair pay agreements. Um, you may have seen some of the press around this, which has been largely negative. Surprise, surprise, because really it is a shift from my perspective, backwards in terms of labour relations uh, in New Zealand. So to give you a little bit of context, in New Zealand, employment relationships are governed by one of either two of agreements, a collective employment agreement, which is essentially an enterprise bargaining agreement, or the same as, or an individual employment agreement. Fair pay agreements are going to be a bit different and are going to be look a little bit like modern awards in Australia. So a lot of you are sort of used to this system. We're not. Fair pay agreements have been loosely modelled on modern awards, um, although I don't think we see... Have you got 120 or 140? No, 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 we won't, we won't see that many. There's not even that many people in New Zealand, so we won't, um, we won't see that many. So, look, in December, this legislation came into force. What does it do? It is a collective agreement, but not a New Zealand collective agreement, but it will cover a collection of employees, and it will set a floor. So minimum terms that apply across either that industry, sector, or occupation. So that's the similarity uh, with the modern awards. But it will sit alongside the individual employment agreement and the collective employment agreement that are already in those workplaces. And I'm going to get on to how that's going to work uh, in a bit. It'll sit around for a term of, say, three to five years. I think your modern awards are negotiated or renewed every three to four. Is that right? So similar potentially a little bit longer, as I said, based on uh, modern awards. Um, why are we doing it? Well, it's intended to allow employees a sort of a better space in which to negotiate better terms, as it were. Um, so it's really driven uh, largely by lifting uh, minimum standards. Who does it affect? For the main part, those in sort of lower paid roles, uh, industries where there's less scope, um, for career progression and so on. So really minimum code employees who, who receive minimum wage, minimum entitlements, minimum statutory uh, benefits and so on. And we're really going to see movement in this space from those industries that are heavily uh, unionised. Now, bear in mind that in New Zealand, it's only somewhere between 15 and 20% of workplaces that are unionised, so it's still relatively low, probably similar to here in terms of your enterprise bargaining agreement stats, but I think we're going to see more of that with the introduction of fair pay agreements. Now, the government has said they're going to fund four fair pay agreements uh, a year. Bearing in mind it's election year in New Zealand, and we may see a change of government on the 14th of October, I'm not sure they'll get to four. Uh, the Conservative government have said that they will overturn uh, this law. They are not in favour of fair pay agreements. So we may have to... Um, pull out of fair, claim, fair pay agreements before we get in. Uh, but watch this space. Um, who knows what's going to happen come election time. So 
What's happened with the government funding for fair pay agreements is that four applications have already gone in. Uh, the regulator has set up a dashboard uh, on its website to show which applications have gone in, and those are for hospitality workers, supermarket workers, bus drivers, and cleaners of buses, so quite a specific category there. Um, interestingly, in New Zealand, the supermarket uh, sector is a duopoly. There's essentially progressives uh, and foodstuffs, and what they've done in reaction to this legislation coming in is lift everybody's wage anyway. So it's probably had the intended effect already, but the union is going to go to the table and try and negotiate a fair pay agreement anyway. Now, they can vary fair pay agreements. They can apply to an occupation uh, specifically or, as I said, across an entire sector uh, or industry. So... One of the, Rick, if we can move on, one of the complexities with fair pay agreements that I'm not sure the government has got quite right is how the bargaining works. It's incredibly complex. Uh, it, it, it requires both parties to take a real deep dive into uh, what they're doing as an industry and as a sector, which are not always cohesive uh, across organisations. And there's a lot of box ticking involved, from my perspective anyway. So initiated generally by a union who's got to get 10% of the particular workforce that they want to cover or a 1,000 employees. Um, alternatively, they can use a public interest test to get a fair pay agreement going. So that would be uh, in sectors or industries where everybody is lowly paid. There's no career progression uh, or, or uh, career development at all. Um, the fair pay agreement's got to be improved, approved by the regulator. As I said, there's four um, on the website at the moment that have been going through their initial approval stages. Once they're approved, there's a double barrel notification. So the initiating union's got to go out and tell all the employees, yes, we're negotiating a fair pay agreement. And then once the employer knows about this, they've got 15 days to notify the affected unions in their uh, sector and employees. But there is no central database in New Zealand of what employees are doing what or what unions are doing what. So that's a real, it's sort of an, an impractical step in New Zealand and it remains to be seen how that's going to work as these fair pay agreements roll out. Now, in terms of the bargaining parties, the union comes to the table for the relevant employees. The legislation says that the employers who are covered by this fair pay agreement have got to bring an association uh, to represent them. The problem is there aren't any employer associations in New Zealand. There's a few. I mean, there's the Retail Workers Association that have put their hand up and said, well, if a fair pay agreement comes in for retail, we'll do the representation. But there are a load of sectors and industries with no representation. The government has said, well, if you can't come to the party and represent uh, with an employer representation, there'll be default parties. One of those is Business New Zealand who have said, actually, we don't really want to be involved in this. So you can see that some of the problems are already starting to surface. The legislation hasn't been particularly well thought through from that part. Now, the problem, the, one of the issues with these bargaining parties is, is if the employers don't get themselves together and get a representation, then the Employment Relations Authority, which I suppose is the equivalent of the Fair Pay uh, Commission here, can actually set the terms of the Fair Pay Agreement. And I'm going to get on to why I see that as being a real issue as these sort of unfold. Now, coverage can be industry versus occupation. Like I've said, the union decide that when they put their application in. And there's a 25% rule. So, uh, rule. so if you're an employee and 25% of your work is covered by that particular application, then you're in, in terms of the fair pay. So if we move on a uh, little bit more detail on bargaining, um, some aspects there that must be covered in a fair pay agreement, what you would expect, uh, overtime, um, hours, base wages, and so on. But there's a number of other terms that must be discussed in terms of setting a floor. You'd expect to see things like health and safety there and arrangements in relation to redundancy. So it starts to look like a classic collective employment agreement. Um, in terms of being finalised, there is a compliance assessment once the fair pay agreement is bargained and, and decided upon or agreed upon. That compliance assessment again is done um, by uh, the regulator, which we have issues with given the quality and under-resourcing of our regulator at the moment. And I don't mean to be critical, I'm, um, at that, I'm expressing my view there. Uh, and then there's some voting weights and requirements, which are unusually complex. Um, but this is New Zealand legislation, so we're not particularly surprised by that. 
So look, just going on to the authorities' um, role, they, with the regulator, compliance assess the fair pay agreement. Is this going to work? Is it com compliant? And like I said before, they can actually say, um, if there are no bargaining parties, we're going to set the terms. Um, there are penalties also for failing to come to the table in good faith. Good faith is our favourite term in New Zealand uh, from employment relations, as you two know, we bring it up all the time. Parties who are, who are bargaining for anything in New Zealand have to, um, have to approach those discussions in good faith. So if we move on to the next slide, um, Rick, sort of key issues and takeaways, and I have touched on uh, a bit of this. Because there are no established employer bargaining sides, I think there's going to be a scramble in some industries for employers to get organised and there's going to be a real lack of cohesion in these bargaining parties, which puts the employer uh, at a disadvantage from the get-go. Um, there's a real inability in New Zealand to assess, assess the thresholds for employee numbers and percentages because, as I said before, there's no central database of where these employees are, where they're working, what industries they're involved in, and indeed the unions as well. So it remains to be seen how that's going to work. Um, the employer notification requirement related to that is, is largely impractical. How do you let every employee in your sector know uh, that there's been an application for fair pay when you don't know who those individuals are? So, it, you know, it may be improved. Um, the most favourable terms approach is a real bugbear of mine because what this legislation allows is for employees to cherry pick their most favourable terms. So say a fair pay agreement is agreed between the employer association and the union, there will always be in that workplace individual employment agreements that people are working under and established collective employment agreements that were negotiated between that employer and that union. As an employee, you can pick two terms from the fair pay agreement, three or four terms from the collective employment agreement, and if you've got an individual as well, you can take some of those. So there's a real cherry picking aspect here. Um, using the Employment Relations Authority as a backstop is, uh, as I said, has issues. There is quality issues with the Employment Relations Authority and the members that sit as part of the authority. They're not always trained and qualified uh, in employment law to the level that we would like, and they are massively under-resourced. So who's going to do all this work? We're not sure. Um, there is also the misclassification of contractor issues. It's, it's an issue in New Zealand, and I am going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, there are employers that will have contractors um, within their organisations that are deemed to be covered by the fair pay agreement and that employer wouldn't have even deemed them to be employees. So there's an inherent risk there. Some of these agreements might go for five years. That's an issue in some industries, particularly those that change quickly uh, and have rapid pace of change. Uh, also collaboration between competitors. If you're forced to come to the table and negotiate a fair pay agreement with other employers that you have nothing to do with, uh, where, you're, uh, where your organisations are, are not cohesive or indeed could be competitive, you will be forced to share information that you might not want to. Um, and that's got risks of its own. So that was hugely negative and I apologise for that. You can probably interpret my views on the fair pay agreements, but let's watch this space and see what happens. Thanks, Laura. Um, you can only take so much New Zealand accent, so we're kind of alternating a little bit. Um, I thought I would talk about the contractor decision. So the High Court handed down um, two important decisions at the beginning of, beginning of last year, um, which kind of threw out all the case law on the difference between an employee and a contractor. So prior to those decisions, the courts would look at the written agreement between a principal and a contractor. And obviously one of the factors was if the party said it was a, uh, an independent contractor agreement, they'd look at that and any other terms in the written agreement. But they went behind it as well and they looked at what you might call more substantive issues. How did the relationship actually work? Um, you know, who provided the equipment? What level of control was there? Um, was there a guarantee of work? Was the person who was alleged to be a contractor engaged in an independent business, et cetera? And when they looked at all those factors, they would form a view about whether in substance it was a contract or employment relationship. So what happened was the High Court said, no, no, that's not that's not the position at all, never has been basically, even though that's the position in the UK as well. They said, you just look at the terms of the written agreement and if they're pretty much complete, that's all you have to do. Interpret the agreement. If it looks like a contractor agreement, then the relationship is an independent contractor one. 
And just briefly, those two cases, the first one, personnel contracting, that was a case where um, Labor Hire Company provides an employee, Mr McCourt, who was a backpacker to third-party clients. In this case, they provided him to one contra- construction company. And the terms of the agreement said he was a, quote, self-employed contractor, unquote. And the uh, Labor Hire Company controlled where he went, how much he got paid. They negotiated the rates and everything. And he was under the supervision of the Labor Hire Company or the third-party client. And they were all contained in the terms of the agreement. The parties agreed that was a complete set of terms. And the full federal court, when they heard the case, said, no, he's a he's actually a contractor, uh, not an employee based on those terms because the union had challenged that. Goes to the high court. They said, no, he's actually an employee. When you look at the agreement and the terms, even though it said he's a self-employed contractor, he had really no control over his work and, and the direction um, that he had or the autonomy he had, and he couldn't set his rates. So he was really an employee when you interpret the terms of the agreement. Contrast that with the other one, uh, the ZG operations case. You had two uh, individuals who'd been truck drivers. They'd been employees of the company ZG uh, for a number of years. And then I think the company said, you know, we can't need, we can't have you as employees anymore. You need to be um, contractors because this model doesn't work anymore. So they converted to become contractors. There was a written agreement in place and they were actually engaged at their request as a partnership with their spouses. So the comp- the partnership was paid the money and they'd split the income, no doubt, for favourable tax consequences. They provided their own truck, so they had to pay for the truck, they had to pay for the maintenance of it. Interestingly, they were told what to deliver. So they had no choice about what products they delivered. They were working for a lighting company. Um, but they could choose the route that they took. You know, that was big autonomy there, but they could do that. They had to wear, the truck had the ZG logo on it, not their own logo. They did have ZG uniforms, but they weren't required to wear them. So all of this stuff was contained in the written terms. High Court looked at it. First instance, the full federal court said, no, they're actually employees. Uh, They were doing the same work as before. There was this unequal bargaining power, so they kind of had to accept the terms of this agreement, so found their employees. High court said, no, they're contractors. So you can imagine the federal court going, I've got no idea what's going on here. Um, Probably a lot of lawyers said the same thing. So I think the upshot of the cases for in-house counsel um, is that the terms of these written agreements become more important than ever um, so what's important is first that you have a complete agreement. So as far as possible, the terms have to reflect the relationship. Secondly, you have to obviously act in accordance with those terms. Now, then you're probably safe in terms of it being a contract relationship, but here are some caveats. One is that the High Court talked about that wouldn't be the case if it was a sham contracting arrangement, if there was some sort of suggestion of it being a sham. Or secondly, if um, the contract had been varied by the conduct of the parties. So if there was something in, even though the agreement, the terms had something in it, for example, that they provide their own truck, if in fact what was happening was that the company bought the truck or that the company was paying for those fuel costs, then that might be a variation of that term of the agreement. And I think what we're going to see is litigation in those two spaces. So we're going to see litigation challenging the classification of an individual as a contractor by unions and and applicant representatives on the basis that it's either a sham arrangement, that it really doesn't reflect the truth or substance of the relationship, or secondly, that there's there's been actually a variation. The parties are acting in a different way to those terms. So I think in a lot of ways, yes, it's going to change things. It's going to make the terms important, but I think it's going to mean that the uh, substance of it is still going to be something that um, individuals use as a basis to challenge that classification. So I think in some ways we're going to see a lot of similar litigation, and I think the federal court is much more sympathetic to um, characterising individuals as um, contractors, particularly this kind of um, more blue collar workforce than maybe the high court. And of course, most of these cases never get to the high court. This is somewhat unusual 
uh, and so forth. So I think we're going to see that. The second thing that's important in this area is the Labor government um, has flagged, of course, that they're going to make some changes to the gig economy and as part of that to any employee-like arrangements, as they call them. So um, it looks like at the end, that's probably the second half of this year, there's going to be some changes made to perhaps an extended definition of what is a, a contractor or a worker, I should say, an employee, to cover perhaps these kind of arrangements. So in other words, legislatively overriding some of this stuff. Um, and obviously the gig economy is is in particular part of their focus. We don't know the detail of it, so it's really hard to comment on what they will do. Laura's going to talk about what's happening in New Zealand. Maybe they're going to borrow that sort of stuff, um, which they've done before, of course. Um, and so we might see that. The only thing they are saying is that it looks like the Fair Work Commission will get some powers to deal with unfair contracts in the case of um, independent contractor agreements. So they might be able to overturn contracts or award compensation. We don't know. We just know that the intent is for the Fair Work Commission to be more involved. So I think this is going to be a space that is going to change throughout 2023. And even if there are no major legislative changes, what we're going to see is um, some litigation in this space again and again. It's not over and it's great news for lawyers in my view. Um, so on that note, I'll hand over to Laura, who's going to talk about the Restraint of Trade Bill in New Zealand. Thanks, Rick. We don't borrow everything because in New Zealand, we still have the multifactorial approach and the contract is only one aspect of consideration in terms of whether someone's a, a contractor or an employee. So, um, so you're on your own with that one. Interesting decision. Look, this one came out of the blue for us. This is the Restraint of Trade Bill. And... Um, I didn't actually see a problem in this space, nor were we expecting uh, this bill, but it arrived a couple of months ago. And this is a bill to reduce or remove the use of restraint of trade clauses in individual employment agreements. Now, in New Zealand, we have a system much like Australia. We have non-competes, non-solicits, non-poach, non-deal. They're quite common in employment agreements now. Periods run from anywhere between, say, two months for a relatively junior employee, right up to, say, 12 months for a senior exec who has a lot of control or influence uh, over the organisation or access to clients, databases, confidential information. So we see them all the time. As I said, I didn't really see a problem uh, in this space, but this bill has identified that perhaps there is. So what does it do? It says that an employer must have a genuine proprietary interest to justify a restraint. Well, we know that. That's a common law principle in New Zealand. So really this legislation seeks to codify uh, that principle. But importantly, it bans all restraints for employees earning under three times the minimum wage. Now that's about 120,000 New Zealand dollars. The problem with that is from sector to sector, 120,000 varies in terms of whether that will be paid to quite a junior employee or in fact, that's your most senior employees. But you can't have a restraint in accordance with this bill if you earn under 120,000. If you do earn over 120,000, then the employer does have the right to impose a restraint, but six months is it. And it doesn't matter what level of seniority you are, bearing in mind in the New Zealand that anybody can bring in an unjustified dismissal or a disadvantage grievance. It doesn't matter if you're earning 20,000 a year or, or 20 million a year, anyone can bring a complaint. So you can only have six months from termination, but the employer must compensate the employee for that. And it's got to be over and above existing salary. So the compensation has to be half the weekly earnings during the restraint period. So when an employee leaves their employment, resigns or is dismissed or whatever it is, uh, they have to be paid for the subsequent six months for the restraint. Now, the legislation doesn't cover how that actually works in practice. And we know that when we often give an employee a lump sum for something and then seek to get it back, that's nigh on impossible. Uh, so I don't think lump sum payments are necessarily going to work. Um, alternatively, post-termination, there could be payroll issues in terms of drip feeding the employee the six months to account for uh, the, the restraint period. It's not clear in the legislation either 
whether garden leave factors into this, whether you can pop someone on garden leave for three months for their notice period, then terminate, then the drip feed of the six months uh, compensation counts. So again, it's legislation that I'm not sure uh, addresses a problem that we had. It hasn't been thoroughly thought through. Thank God the, the legislation says that duties of confidentiality and, and fidelity are still there. But if we move on to the next slide, um, Rick, just a few, a, a few thoughts of, of mine. We already have restrictions on non-competes. It's already unfair in New Zealand to stop someone competing uh, for a reason that can't be justified. Um, Broadbands for other restraints like solicitation, dealing and poaching could have unintended consequences. Someone that earns 120000 in a particular sector and is relatively senior can now go off and poach and solicit clients and employees. Um, I've got a real problem with that in terms of being able to protect one's business. Um, we think it might have an impact on salaries. If we've got this sort of $120,000 benchmark, is that going to force some employees to pop uh, employees under that that 120K and, and uh, not restrain them? Or is it is it an incentive to pop them over so that they can restrain them? So it, I, I think there's going to be an issue there in terms of uh, the exact amounts. Um, we're not sure about how commission works. Loads of industries and sectors now uh, still have commission payments completely unaddressed. Uh, in this legislation in terms of is that popped on top of the minimum wage uh, or is it treated separately? Um, like I've said, retaining employees on a payroll post-termination to pay them the sum is unusually complex, uh, as well as trying to get back a lump sum that you've already paid to the employee, nigh on impossible. Um, it's been floated that a more workable option is to adopt sort of fixed term contracts post termination. You go into some sort of special fixed term contract where you're restrained and you're being paid half your salary, uh, but you're still an employee and sort of halfway on the payroll. Um, I'm not sure how this is going to work. It's only in its first reading. So it could be that this is just removed uh, uh, from, the, um, from the list of things to do by our government. And I, I certainly hope it is because I don't, I don't think it's addressing a problem we have. Um, but interesting food for thought anyway in terms of a proposed change. Okay. Uh, shifting gears entirely to giving employees some additional entitlements during employment, I'm going to talk about two new changes which are being one which has just been introduced and one which is flagged to be introduced by the middle of this year. The first is paid family and domestic violence leave, which has just been implemented as of the beginning of this month for non-small business employers. This change introduces 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave for all employees. So that's full-time, part-time and casual employees are all entitled to 10 days paid leave. And differently from other forms of leave, annual leave and sick leave, it doesn't accrue progressively throughout employment. The entitlement is from day one, you could start and be able to access this leave. It's also unusual um, in terms of how it has to be treated by employers because when employees access this leave, they can't be given a payslip which actually says you've taken family and domestic violence leave. In fact, the payslip can't even say that the employee has taken any form of leave at all. The regulations which have just been introduced say that when an employee takes this form of leave, it should appear on their payslip as if it is ordinary hours of work or as close to possible um, to what their payslip would usually say. Um, and that's obviously intended to um, counteract a scenario where someone who's experiencing violence um, has someone who is perhaps the perpetrator of violence see that payslip and understand that they've been accessing that leave. It also needs to be treated differently by employers in that there is a specific prohibition in the legislation that when employees access this leave, and particularly if they provide evidence of the need to take that leave, which employers are still entitled to request from employees, any information which is given to the employer must be treated as confidentiality, uh, sorry, as confidential um, as far as is practicable. And that's unusual because that's a specific prohibition just for this form of leave. It doesn't appear elsewhere in the Fair Work Act. 
And so what that might mean in practice is that businesses need to have specific arrangements when employees seek to take this leave to limit information. So it's not perhaps your entire payroll or finance team which processes the leave. It's a specific person or specific people within the business that can see that that leave has been accessed. Uh, only because it's those particular people that need to know and maintain those records. The second change has been flagged and budgeted for but hasn't been introduced yet, which is an increase in the entitlement to pay parental leave, but also a change in how the leave is taken between uh, partner partners within a couple. So the government has flagged and has introduced legislation which it's hoping to pass this month um, so that it can be put in place by July this year to change the entitlement to paid parental leave so that it is a shared entitlement of 20 weeks between a partner couple. And the aim is that that will then increase by one week each year until there is a total entitlement to 26 weeks. And the aim of the legislation is really to encourage both partners in a couple to take parental leave. And there is going to be a use it or lose it element of the leave, which is that where it is a partner couple accessing the leave, two weeks must be used by one partner. Otherwise, that entitlement is gone. So if you've got two parents, you can choose to share it between you as you like. But if one partner doesn't take at least two weeks, that two weeks disappears and you can't access it. So that's going to be an interesting thing in terms of companies who offer additional paid leave, particularly top up leave arrangements in terms of whether you will then choose to top up full amount or whether you might restrict it um, because the current entitlement is obviously 18 weeks for a primary error. Back to Laura. Thank you. Well, look, Rick has already alluded to this in terms of the a third category of an of employee being introduced in New Zealand. Currently, we have either a contractor or an employee. There's no draft legislation in this space at the moment, but the government keep promising that this is going to happen. And we know that in the UK they have three categories, so they have this worker category um, already. So the government have said this change is going to be imminent. Um, as I say, it's election year and we do have a new Prime Minister who's a little bit hands-off with employment stuff. For obvious reasons, we've got bigger issues going on in New Zealand at the moment. So the third category of worker is really to address those contractors who are dependent um, on the employer rather than truly independent contractors in business for themselves. The government have recognised that, in fact, we have a lot of status and misclassification issues in New Zealand, probably as, as many as, as you do. Um, there is a little bit of sham contracting uh, going on in New Zealand. For the main part, we see it in uh, what we call the unattractive side of franchising. So that can be really in any sector or industry. And a lot of organisations are taking on contractors that they don't have to pay minimum wage to and they don't have to offer statutory benefits to, which means they can undercut competitors when they're going in and trying to win contracts. So we're seeing a little bit a little bit of that in New Zealand. So this third category of worker uh, will be looking more closely at whether or not the individual is actually dependent um, on that employer, some of the factors to look at, whether or not they're working for a range of different um, principles or providers, whether or not they're wearing a uniform, Rick already alluded to that in the most recent case, setting their own hours and so on. Um, it is going to have implications for businesses that do rely on contractor models, and IT is a classic example. Uh, in New Zealand, they have heavy reliance on that contractor model. So it could lead to some significant shifts. It's a gig economy issue, essentially. I, I think it is anyway. Um, there could be implications for workers in terms of lack of choice there, because we do have a lot of workers that enter New Zealand to work in the IT industry and, in fact, want to work as contractors. That is their choice. But they're largely dependent on the person that the end the organisation that takes them on. They don't want to share their work around, but they like that arrangement, whether it be for tax uh, or other reasons. So a change that's on the horizon, we recently had the Uber case uh, in New Zealand where the court held that actually all Uber drivers are employees. Uh, so that is the direction in which our, our courts are heading. So let's see if the government comes in and makes some change in this space.
It's always about protecting employees. It'd be nice to have some legislation that protects employers, wouldn't it? That'd be nice. Um, a couple of other things that um, have been introduced, which I think might be of interest, is um, one dealing with fixed-term contracts. So uh, a lot of employees are engaged on fixed-term contracts, uh, including that you know have clauses in there that allow the employer to terminate earlier, but they have a fixed date and an end date. Uh, one of the advantages of those is that when the contract expires, generally the employee can't make an unfair dismissal claim because they haven't been dismissed. It's just termination by agreement. So they've become popular. The other thing is often you're not entitled to redundancy pay. So there's some advantages to that. The government's decided that they're being misused and so they're limiting how they can be used. So from the end of this year, so this change doesn't come in until the 6th of December uh, of this year, you can't have a fixed term contract for more than two years. You can't um, renew the contract if they're doing the same kind of work more than once. Um, so some pretty significant changes that will have a big impact on a lot of employers. There are some exemptions, um, but I think the irony of this is probably it's Commonwealth and state governments that use fixed term contracts the most anyway. Um, but there are some exemptions like specialist skills in, on a particular project, for example. There's some. There's one exception for uh, uh, contracts which are partly government funded or partly or wholly government funded. Don't know what that really means yet, but that's uh, one of the exceptions. There's some exceptions for certain apprentices uh, and so forth. There's exceptions for temporary workers. So perhaps if someone's on parental leave for a very long period of time, for example, then the two-year rule can get around that. Um, there are also provisions about anti-avoidance, so you can't just slightly change the duties, et cetera. You can't um, have a bit of a, a gap in between engaging the employee to try and break the, the nexus between contracts. But it seems what you can do is just not employ that person and employ someone else to do the same job. So bit unusual. Um, this will be an interesting area and a lot of employers are going to have to think about it because one, you can't put someone on a fixed term contract for more than two years. But secondly, uh, if you want to put someone on a three month contract for a certain task uh, and you renew it once, you won't be able to renew it a second time, even if the total might only be six months. So you need to think about how you plan the use of fixed term contracts uh, and so forth. Um, if if your contract is in breach, so it's more than two years or you've renewed it more than once, it becomes basically an ongoing contract. So you've lost the uh, advantage, if you like, of the fixed term contract. They're just a permanent employee entitled to all the normal benefits that uh, permanent employees would have. So by the end of the year, businesses really need to start thinking about are they, how they're using these contracts and whether it's still going to be compliant, and if not, whether they need to start adjusting the way they're using these kind of contracts. Um, the, there's also a requirement to give employees, new employees, when they take, they're employed on fixed-term contracts, uh, an, an information statement that basically says a lot of the things I've just told you so that employees are aware of their rights um, when they're on fixed-term contracts. Um, the, the other change that's been made is relating, relating to flexible work arrangements. There's already a provision in the National Employment Standards that allows employees to seek a flexible work arrangement and the requirement is for an employer to respond within 21 days, et cetera. Basically, the provisions have strengthened the kind of rigour around uh, the decision-making process of employers. So if an employer is going to reject uh, a flexible work request. They need to have a discussion with the employee. They need to set out their reasons in more detail. They need to have shown that they've considered an alternative arrangement. They need to show that they've considered the impact on the employee of rejecting it, et cetera. Um, so a lot more rigor around what you have to demonstrate as an employer. And then much more importantly, if an employee is not happy that their request has been rejected, they can now take it to the Fair Work Commission and the Fair Work Commission can arbitrate it. So. This is going to mean a lot more of these flexible work requests, including I want to work from home uh, for various reasons. So expect to see that um, during 2023. Um, the next change I really like is about pay secrecy terms. So um, if you weren't aware of this, uh, you can no longer have a contract that says that an employee has to keep the terms of their remuneration confidential. 
Um, it's not just a remuneration clause that has to be kept that you can't keep confidential anymore. It's any term that might uh, affect the calculation of the remuneration. So in, in other words, hours of work clauses, for example. So you can't say that you must, uh, you're not allowed to tell anyone about your hours of work. You can't stop people talking about any bonus they receive, probably a, an incentive or equity plan if that's a term of it. If you haven't already done so, you should be checking employment contracts because uh, most of this stuff is hidden in a little clause in the sort of miscellaneous section down the back and it says you must keep the terms of this contract confidential. So that's a clear breach of those new provisions. They came in on the 6th of December. So if you have contracts with that clause in them, in new contracts that were issued after the 6th of December, you're already in breach of the Fair Work Act. That's a penalty of um, $16,500. Um, so be aware that's for an individual and $82,500 for a company. So you, you've got to make sure that you've reviewed any of your new or template contracts because from the 6th of December last year, um, this change has came in, came in. So a very important one. Um, the final one I just wanted to talk about was multi-employer bargaining. I mean, this is a big topic and it probably deserves its own topic, um, as boring as it might be for a lot of people. Um, the main changes here are that it really allows unions to rope in employers into the one agreement. So we're not, again, we're not sure how it works. It's called a single interest employer um, kind of process. And basically it's if you can uh, convince the Fair Work Commission that there are a number of employers who each have a common uh, interest, you can try and bargain with them. And as an employer, you might be forced to bargain with the union and other employers as part of this sort of multi-employer agreement if there's a common interest. And it's not clear what the common interest is. There are a lot of factors, geography, nature of the business, etc. But one of the things we don't know is, does that mean that you might be roped into bargaining with your competitors because you're similar businesses? Or does it mean you might be roped in with your supply chain uh, and all of those uh, are incorporated. So you can imagine a union thinking, well, we want to have an agreement with Coles. We could either have an agreement with Coles and Woolworths and Aldi and all that, or would it be better if they have an agreement with Coles and all of its major distributors? Because then it would tie up all of that sort of weight, all wages in that sort of industry for Coles, make it um, easier for them to recruit members in that whole industry and secondly, try and push up wages because they've got coals as a bit of an anchor and it forces up wages down the supply chain. So there's some of the things we're going to be seeing again this year. Most of the changes have come in. Uh, some further changes come in around industrial action and the better off overall test um, during the middle of the year. But some really important changes for employers who are going to be bargaining, including those who weren't previously bargaining, you're going to be getting a knock on the door from unions much more likely during 2023 and beyond. And back to Laura. Thanks, Rick. I've got a couple of minutes, so I'll go through these quite quickly. The personal grievance bill is in its third reading, so this will become law. It really is, a, I suppose, a delayed reaction to some of the Me Too issues that have come up um, in New Zealand over the last sort of five or six years. Um, what it does is it extends the time an employee has to raise a personal grievance if that personal grievance is in relation to sexual harassment. Now, currently in New Zealand, you have 90 days from the date of an event or something that happens at work that you want to complain about to raise something called a personal grievance. What this does is it says, well, if your complaint is in relation to sexual harassment, you now have a year. So it's similar to your respective work act extensions. A um, little bit of uncertainty for employers because lots of employers in New Zealand kind of hold on for those 90 days, hoping nothing comes in and it doesn't. Woo, let's move on. Now you've got to wait a year. There might be some complexity in terms of employee, employees having multiple complaints. How does that work? Do you have to raise some in the 90 days and you've got a, a, a year for the sexual harassment? Who knows? Um, this will go through. It's It's been uh, got unanimous uh, kind of uh, support um, in the House. So it will be, there will be an extension uh, of time. Let's see how it rolls out in practice uh, for employers. Uh, now, last but not least, 
We do have a problem in New Zealand with the exportation of migrant workers. Um, it hasn't been an issue for some time because our borders were closed forever over the pandemic. But now that they have slightly opened, we've got more migrant workers coming in. The government have recognised, and rightly so, that we have an issue with some employers exploiting migrant workers. In reaction to those issues, the government have uh, introduced measures that will mean that those employers that are exploiting migrant workers are going to be watched very closely. There's more power in regulators and officials from both the immigration department and the labour regulator uh, to go in to demand documentation, to demand to see how those em uh, employees are being treated. There will be offences for failing to disclose documentation are you paying the minimum wage? Are your employees having holidays? That type of thing. Uh, there's also going to be a name and shame list. Um, it's sort of already there in New Zealand, which you would expect. Um, a blacklist of people that can't uh, employ migrant workers. That's going to be sort of extended and relied on more. And there is also, interestingly, going to be sanctions um, against certain individuals, against them managing an organisation or being a director of an organisation if they have been found to be exploiting migrant workers. So just some new powers there for the regulators and for those employers that employ migrant workers, they are really going to need to watch um, how compliant they are um, in their day-to-day -day employment uh, operations. And that's it. Have we got time for a couple of quick questions? Assuming anyone has any. One. Yes. Uh, well, employees are allowed to talk about it first off, so they can share it and discuss it and you can't stop them doing that. And it's only if you've got something in a contract that says prohibits them from disclosing either the terms of their employment generally or that, you know, that particular issue, then you'd be in breach. And I think terms of employment is going to be pretty broad because it's anything that affects their remuneration. So you'd argue that I think it's a pretty good argument that those options could be part of their employment, unless it's separate and maybe just relates to their role as a director, for example, that might be a different issue. But yes, it would be captured if you have a clause that prohibits that sort of disclosure.